Hello and welcome to this, my 23rd CPD Coffee Time session with me, Dr Tina Ray. Today the focus is going to be on supporting the mental health of teens. As many of you who have listened to these um, presentations before, you'll know that I was formerly a teacher. I'm currently working as a consultant psychologist for Compass Fostering, supporting looked after children, foster carers and social workers. I'm also a therapeutic supervisor to attachment workers with the company and also, of course, I write prolifically. Um, many of my publications can be found with the charity Nurture UK. I'm very proud of our long association and production of a range of evidence-based um, tools and resources to promote the well-being and mental health of young people. I also write extensively for Hinton House Publishers with the wonderful Sarah Miles. And um, this association is ongoing and we're currently uh, producing three resources on mental health for children, young people to um, enable them to navigate their way through this current pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, and also a resource on emotionally based school avoidance. So do watch out for those. So the focus today is adolescents, teenagers. And hopefully this presentation will outline some of the difficulties, some of the misconceptions and myths, and also some of the ways in which we can effectively support them at this time, at this current time. I'm also going to um, focus on a key resource from Nurture UK, the Wellbeing Toolkit for Teens, and present some of the practical activities which I hope you can take away and use very easily, almost straight away. So to start with, just to focus briefly on this notion of the demonisation of teenagers, it's ever, ever been thus, I think. So here we've got a quote. I would there was no age between 10 and 3 and 20, for there is nothing in the in-between but getting wenches with child, wronging the ancient tree, stealing and fighting. So, of course, we know that this was from Shakespeare's Winter's Tale. And some more bad press. The children now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter in the place of exercise. Children are now tyrants. And no surprise, of course, this came from the Greek philosopher Socrates. So why is this an important focus? Young people in our society, currently there are six million of them who are aged between 10 to 19 in the United Kingdom. So they are a significant group and I think more than ever we need to be focusing on their health, their well-being, their mental health in particular, given the fact that these are the young people who will, who will be developing their minds, will be developing new ideas, will be getting involved in politics and social change, social justice, will be making a difference hopefully to their communities in the future, from now and into the future. So I think that they are so well worth our work, our attention, our love and nurture. And of course, what we mustn't underestimate is the fact that it's young people, our teenagers, who bear most acutely the effects of any changes in our society. So if you think about perhaps the, the COVID pandemic currently that we're going through, of course, what have they lost? They've lost loads of rites of passage, changing into new year groups, leaving schools, starting at university or college, going into any kind of higher education, going into a new workplace. There's, there are huge issues for them at this, this moment in time. And many of the rights of, of transition that they would have had, those passages um, and rights of transition seem to have been taken away from them. So there's a sense of loss and bereavement and disenchantment, I think. But they've always, I think, been affected by inequalities such as poverty, unemployment, homelessness, family breakdown, drugs and alcohol, etc. And of course, at this current moment in time, we know that those children from poor and most, the most impoverished backgrounds have been the most significantly affected by COVID. Many of them have not had access to computers, to the internet in their home context, and have not been able to continue with accessing their education. Also, of course, in terms of changes in their leisure activities, they've been denied the opportunities to engage in a range of usual pursuits, which would have promoted friendships, well-being, connectedness with others, and of course, their mental and physical health. So there are enormous problems that will affect them currently, but have always affected them within our society. 
and we know about the death rates in 15 to 19 year olds and we know the major causes are accidents, violence and unfortunately the third one is suicide. So what actually changes in adolescence? Clearly there are physical changes that puberty um, that they go through in puberty and this includes hormonal changes, the, the maturing of their brain, the so-called synaptic pruning, so you use it or lose it phenomenon, and frontal lobe activation, so developing executive function which includes of course impulse control and understanding of cause and effect. So I think that it's really important to remember that these are quite significant changes. The cognitive changes also, so understanding um, abstract concepts such as justice or the mental states of others so that's theory of mind mentalizing and also emotionally affect regulation deferring gratification and depressive position is also something that develops at this time for good or bad um, self-identity and individuation or separation, gender identity, differentiating from the family, moving away, separating and achieving a mature sense of their own sexuality. And also in a social way, adopting more adult roles. And this includes uh, moving from gangs to groups, etc. And there are pro-social versus anti-social peer groups, of course, here that they may engage with at this time. So the trajectory for them is really quite steep from the age of about 11, 12 in terms of academic qualifications and skills development and also social skills and living skills and more independent living skills. But the available support, unfortunately, does not match this trajectory of the development of these particular skills and qualifications. And of course, we know that there is this gap between children's services, schools, mental health or health and social services and adult services for children and young people at this stage. So this is an issue. This is when many of them get um, very, very stressed, very, very anxious, but also fail to, to access the kind of support, the level of support that they possibly might well need. And of course, why it's so important for us to be focusing on the mental health of our teenagers, it's not simply because of the current COVID pandemic that we're finding ourselves in, but it's also because, of course, we have known from the research for many, many years now that roughly half of all lifetime mental disorders in most studies start by the mid-teens, so 14, 15, 16, and three quarters by the mid-20s. So this is really, really important, and it's the single biggest cause of morbidity at this age. If we delay treatment, um, I think it's really, really important to notice that this can really significantly impact on children's mental health, particularly in terms of depression, personality disorder, access or, um, to drugs and substance abuse, misuse, but also in terms of self-harm, anxiety, lots of the problems that we are increasingly seeing um, in relation to the current levels of stress in this current pandemic. And of course, the, the types of psychiatric disorders, as I, I said previously, are quite wide and varied, but I think majority of our children will not develop psychosis, but many of them will develop some level of anxiety and eating disorders or elements of self-harm during these teenage years. And of course, substance misuse is much, much more commonly a problem than we probably previously um, understood it to be. So what are the risk factors? We know it's gender. We've known this for a long time. Boys are more likely to be diagnosed with a mental health disorder than girls in their, in their teenage years. Um, although I, I do have to just highlight the point, of course, that there are very many girls who are um, diagnosed with anxiety and engage in self-harming behaviours. It's, it's at least one in four now, according to the nice um, data that we've got available to us. Socioeconomic background, of course, children from poor families are 2.5 times more likely to suffer from mental health difficulties. Um, this includes obviously community factors there. And I think this is really, really important to highlight this. There is such inequality here for our children from poorer backgrounds. And it has thankfully, on one level, I'm, I'm grateful to this, it has been really highlighted in this current pandemic, as has um, children's, not just their socioeconomic background, but their cultural backgrounds too. 
Intelligence, of course, low IQ and learning difficulties place children at greater risk of low self-esteem, academic failure. And therefore, of course, there is a link between mental health disorders, potential, potential mental health disorders in the future associated with that. Parenting, of course, is another risk factor. Um, having parents who have mental health difficulties, there is a direct link between that and children, young people developing those difficulties too. And we mustn't underestimate the impact of that. I think it is a bit of an element, elephant in the room for many practitioners, unfortunately. But parenting, conflict, family breakdown, inconsistent discipline and poor relationships, etc. So difficulties in terms of attachment and development of attachment disorders, the experience of trauma in the early years due to poor parenting. And of course, bullying within sibling relationships, trauma and significant life events such as bereavement, homelessness, abuse and removal from the family can also lead to mental health illness if it's not supported long term. And of course, we mustn't underestimate the impact for our looked after children. So we know adolescence and emerging adulthood a high risk time for mental disorders. And it's interesting, Kessler et al. make it very clear in their research and studies that severe disorders are typically preceded by less severe ones. And these are seldom brought to clinical attention. But I think this is where we come in as practitioners, as those who work in school at a more preventative level, because we need to identify early. Early identification is essential to prevent the escalation of these difficulties. Unfortunately, though, there are issues with access to specialist services. And I raise these with um, no embarrassment or sense of um, condemning um, CAM services or the medical professions in any sense whatsoever. But I think it's absolutely es essential that we really highlight this and that we don't give up on asking, requesting for, for more resources, particularly at this time. In 2018, um, the Education Policy Institute, EPI Research, showed us that one in four referrals was either rejected or deemed inappropriate for treatment to our CAM services. And out of 60 providers, 54 of them gave a, a response. Um, and it's really, really important. The increase in mental health referrals for the under 18s increased from 157,000 to 198,280 from 2013 14 to 2017 to 18. And I would um, suggest that this we will be seeing subsequent really huge increases um, during the last two years in particular, even compared to those numbers. So why didn't they meet the criteria for these specialist services or CAMs, etc.? Um, and some of the reasons that they gave were that self-harm refer referrals were only accepted if accompanied by another mental health condition. Um, weight loss of less than 15 percent from their ideal weight for an eating disorder. That was um, had to be accepted. If it was anything like 16 percent, it was not accepted, of course. Um, they must have already engaged with early intervention services and waited a specified length of time. And many providers also said some young people's needs should be met, met by other services, i.e. if they were homeless or have parents with a substance addiction, they were not um, considered appropriate referrals for mental health services. And I give the example of George Hodgson, who's now 22, um, and I think his story was highlighted um, in great detail at the time of the EPI report coming out. He was experiencing really severe anxiety, panic attacks, and he said how he was in a total state, basically, having regular intrusive suicidal thoughts. But after having initially been seen by the CAM service, he was told he wouldn't be seen again for 40 weeks. So he was left feeling really, really, really vulnerable, really frightened. And he and his family decided that ultimately what they would do is get help privately because they couldn't afford to wait. And he didn't really um, know what he would have done had he not been able to access this support and was also very aware of the fact that, of course, this wouldn't be open to anyone who did not have the financial wherewithal in order to pay for it. So in response to this, what did the politicians actually say? They promised this extra 1.4 billion so that the 70. 70,000 more children a year would have access to specialist mental health care by this year going on into next year. Um, and I think it was really interesting, Luciana Berger was very clear that she felt the money wasn't actually reaching the front line. And I would suggest that many of our frontline practitioners in schools, 
teachers senkos inclusion managers would also say the same as would some of our cam services and this was confirmed by dr john Godlin, God, goldin of the royal college of psychiatrists who said that he had colleagues working all over the country who were doing brilliant work but basically their services were just too stretched they could not make them fit for purpose they didn't have adequate staff so the proposal set out by the government um, to overhaul children's mental health care in England were um, pretty extensive and um, I think, you know, quite ambitious. And many of us, when we saw them, were really, really over the moon because we thought, yes, we're going to have mental health leads. We're going to have these services in schools. We've been asking for this for years and years now. We, we need to have clinical help in schools at the point of need. And of course, the training as well um, looked very, very good in terms of, you know, ensuring that all staff felt that they could work more therapeutically. Um, they were saying that basically one in four schools would have this provision in place by 2022. Norman Lamb did not agree with this um, assessment. He felt that it was just all too timid, too little and simply a sticking plaster and couldn't understand how um, it was being presented as something that was extra when already in his particular area in Norfolk, their funding had a real cut in terms of approximately 50 percent. He couldn't marry this up and felt that there was a real need for um, ring fencing, basically. He asked, would you wait 40 weeks to see the oncologist? And now, of course, this COVID-19 pandemic um, is probably piling on more anxiety, more stress than ever to our children, young people, particularly our teens who are very conscious and aware of what they're seeing in the media. Face masks in school, sometimes, sometimes not. Social distancing, always. Navigating this new normal has its own stresses. And of course, as I said previously, what they've experienced is a loss of autonomy, routine, friendships, connections, rituals and those rites of passage. This has definitely engendered a some level of anxiety for all and certainly for those who had pre-existing mental health conditions has exacerbated those as we know from the Young Minds research presented in March 2020 of this year and also from the survey by the Children's Society in August um, this summer. It also now seems to be all their fault. Recent newspaper articles portraying them as being the demons who are now spreading the COVID virus because they're ignoring social distancing room root rules. Um, they're, they're apparently flouting them. Again, teens are being demonised. And I'm very anxious about this and the way in which it's being portrayed because I really don't think that this is the whole picture and I am not sure that it's a really appropriate thing to be doing at this moment in time. Further to this, some new research conducted last month, okay, I'm recording this obviously September, 10th of September, but the new research um, just published has been really quite interesting in terms of showing, I think, that um, the year nine students who were surveyed had felt that during this time out of school that they felt that they had a reduction overall in their levels of anxiety and an increase in well-being. Very interesting. Now these were um, children between the ages of 13 to 14 and it does raise some questions about how the school environment really does affect younger teenagers mental health and well-being. So perhaps not being in school in this period of lockdown actually gave them a protective factor for some of our, our 13 and 14 year olds because basically they weren't having these really high pressures of schoolwork, having to navigate bullying and some kind of subtle challenges also in negotiation relationships with peers and also teachers having to navigate the teacher who you knew does who you know doesn't like you particularly. Um, also that tape that obviously took some pressure off them. And it was interesting, too, that those students who already felt disconnected from school and peers also saw larger improvements in mental health. Um, and that kind of lends support to this theory. And what does this suggest? Um, I think perhaps that there are some positives from this study that we now need to factor in to our daily school life and culture. 
what were the changes that were te teachers making in terms of being able to connect with and communicate with um, these 13 and 14 year olds in this lockdown period? And maybe it's time to reflect and to stop and think about that because some of these may need to be continued. It may be that some of the more flexible approaches, the more one-to-one -one contact, the online stuff that they were doing was extremely helpful and nurturing and took some of that pressure off um, teenagers at this time. And it might be a you know, time to really reflect upon how we might reshape our school cultures and systems to be more supportive of their mental health and well-being. I think we need to get a better understanding of what makes them feel connected to school, how we can strengthen that, and also think what it is about the school culture itself and the way in which we are educating them that is increasing their stress levels. Perhaps we need to reduce some of that. I'm going to obviously highlight some of these as I go through some of the tools from the mental health, that, um, the wellbeing toolkit, sorry, for teens. And some more hopeful good news here, of course, is the DfE on the 6th of June have now developed um, online resources designed by health and education experts for schools and colleges, which will boost mental health support for staff and pupils. So hopefully um, this will be useful, particularly to students returning to the classroom. Um, the Department of Education has announced grants worth more than 750,000. Um, again, I hope that this is not going to be a sticking plaster. So to summarise here, adolescent mental health really does matter because it's at this age, more specifically between the ages of 14 to 25, that a major proportion of severe mental illnesses emerge, what we call the chronic diseases of the young. Also, services have not been well designed to meet the needs of this age group. Um, the, the access to CAM services, the traditional models of CAM services going to the clinic have been seen not to be working for our children and young people in the way that they need to be. So we do need to have this support in-house, in our schools, readily available and accessible at the point of need to ensure early prevention. I think it's also important to remember, however, that there is a lot of resilience out there. There are a lot of children who have managed to develop strategies to protect and nurture their mental health and been able to share those with each other and learnt um, over time from lessons in school on, on well-being and mental health, but also through relationships in the home and with their peers. And I think it's really, really important, particularly if you're a parent or a carer or in, and contrary to popular belief, that the majority of adolescents are not mad. They're not mentally ill, but they do need support to maintain their well-being overall. So one way of doing this, of course, is to ensure not just that the systems are there at a whole school level and, and it permeates relationships in the school, this whole mental health well-being agenda, but also that they have access to evidence based resources that really do work and make a difference and really do highlight the concerns of the children and young people themselves. Very often I talk to staff in schools um, who say we're doing this as a lesson or we've talked to the school council and these are one or two of the topics that they'd like to be covered. I think we need to be very, very clear that children, young people really do need to be involved in designing and developing their curriculum. And it shouldn't be a token gesture, but also that we need to look at the research. We need to look at what the research is telling us in terms of their needs that the idea that suddenly we can magic up a curriculum and it will be appropriate needs to be, um, I think, just challenged more effectively. What we need to do is be asking the children, you know, people and looking at the available research to see what really are the issues for them. So from my perspective and my um, lovely former students at the University of East London who contributed to this resource. The issues then that we highlighted prompted the development of this resource were quite wide and varied, but also some of them really weren't a surprise to us. We knew that family breakdown was widespread. The research showed us about the pressure that children were under to access the perfect lifestyle body, um, money um, and, and, um, and have this kind of celebrity cultured um, agenda going on all the time for them. We also knew that materialist culture really heavily influences young people 
and that 24 hour social networking was something that, that young people were accessing from a much, much earlier age. And many of them were talking about how this impacted on them in terms of keeping them hyper vigilant and comparing themselves to others and, and impacted also on their self-esteem and feelings of overall worthlessness because they didn't feel as if they were having as good a time as others. Body image also was seen as a source of much distress for many young people and bullying both on and offline was described as being rife. Children and young people are also experiencing increased sexual pressures and early sexualization, which threw them into this adult world that they really didn't understand or have the capacity emotionally, physically, mentally to navigate effectively. Also, the research was showing us that violence is rife in many of our communities and the fear of crime is a constant source of distress for thousands of our young people, our teenagers in particular. And of course, school. School itself is getting more and more like an exam factory and university entry has become more competitive and expensive. We also know, of course, from the statistics um, from the government that 13 percent of 16 to 24 year olds are not employment, educational training. So their needs. Um, and of course, we can see that this is going to increase dramatically over the next couple of years as the financial cost of this pandemic is made more apparent. So I'm just going to go into a wee bit more depth as to some of the key issues that we were able to flag up through the research and through um, individual action, action research pieces that some of the students did in terms of identifying what the real issues were for our children, young people, and what they really said they wanted to have some support with in terms of a curriculum for well-being in schools. Online issues came up again and again, as we know that this world, the online world, has definitely exposed our children and young people to the risk of harm, including seeing extreme pornography and engaging in sexting. Uh, the NSPCC and the Children's Commissioner asked Middlesex University to look into how many children had been exposed to pornography and what the impact was on them viewing this kind of content. And it consisted of this research on, of an online survey of 1,001 children and young people aged 11 to 16 across the UK. So again, this is exactly the age group we were writing for when we developed this resource for Nurture UK. Childline had also seen a 6% increase in counselling sessions where the young person specifically mentions concerns about online pornography or websites which contained harmful, distressing content to them. Um, and many of them were talking about being addicted to this and being worried that watching this porn would make them feel aggressive, that they would get addicted to this. And also for some of the boys, there was a real um, fear about the way in which this was affecting them in terms of viewing girls in a different way and it was making them very very worried and I think it's important this quote comes from a boy aged 12 so it's significant the impact and we mustn't underestimate the level of anxiety that this would cause many of our young teens. Overall this research showed us that it, this kind of access to pornography gave our children and young people really unrealistic attitudes about sex and consent and consent was a big big issue that came up again and again understanding what was appropriate in terms of consent what it really meant because watching pornography of course they were not seeing consent they were seeing very often something that was quite abusive and there would be far more negative attitudes developed towards roles and identities in relationships um, and also more casual attitudes towards sex and sexual relationships in general and an increase in, in risky sexual behaviours. And clearly, as I said earlier, this kind of unrealistic expectation of their body image and performance. So the DfE report, Mental Health and Behaviour in Schools, what said that one of the ways by which we could promote mental health was by providing the pupils, the young people with inner resources they could draw on as a buffer when negative or stressful things happen to them. This would help them to thrive even in the face of significant challenges. So all the challenges that I've outlined, which we all know about, I'm sure, compounded now with the challenges of continuing to navigate school life and social life within a COVID pandemic of this sort, um, does make me think very, very much that we need to develop this strengths based curriculum. Um, the report also um, highlighted some of the activities that would bolster mental health. 
and they include terms along the lines of emotional literacy, intelligence, resilience, character, grit, life skills, etc., etc. Um, all of these, in essence, are under the umbrella of what I call positive psychology, which does underpin this particular intervention. So positive psychology, I have um, produced one session in this series just on this topic. So do make reference to that if you would like to learn more about it and the application of that to um, well-being in terms of both students and us as adults. Um, do make reference to that too. Basically, positive psychology is what we would call the scientific study of subjective well-being. It's a technical term, I suppose, for what we would call happiness and the factors that enable us to grow and develop and sustain ourselves in a positive manner, leading a life of real meaning. So it's not simply about happy, being happy. It's about leading a life of real contentment, happiness and well-being in general overall and looking at and identifying our strengths and what really works for us. So it's continually analysing um, what we do well and building upon that rather than focusing upon our deficits, what's gone wrong and what we're not good at. And of course, the message of positive psychology is hugely important, important for children and young people, and particularly at this time, given the prevalence of mental health issues. So very, very important that we recognise why this is important why we need to develop this positive psychology well-being curriculum for our teenagers at this time. 20 years ago Catherine Weir who I have an inordinate amount of respect for talked about mental health as being clearly linked to or described as an increase in the general degree of happiness, vitality, sense of self-worth and achievement alongside an individual's concern and empathy for others. And that's quite interesting because that would suggest that any school-based um, curriculum should really actively prevent unhappiness. So, for example, bullying, violence and conflict, while encouraging our kids to really achieve their goals and feel loved, to feel joyful, to be energetic and to really care about other people. Empathy. So the wellbeing toolkit for teens really does present us with a skills based approach. The resources intended for key stage three and key stage four students and focus on, focuses on the development of health and emotional wellbeing. So physical, mental, emotional, psychological health and well-being and how we foster that. So students awareness is also raised within these sessions of the many factors that can impact both positively and negatively on well-being and they are presented with specific strategies and techniques which would foster emotional, physical and sexual health in particular. And it's important that they're presented with these. It's not dictated to them because ultimately what we want them to be able to do is to develop their own well-being toolbox. What works for all of them may be kind of quite generalised. There may be particular strategies that work for many of us, but it will be an individualised approach. We have to make something bespoke. I want my individual set of tools for maintaining, fostering, keeping my well-being, keeping my head right. So the resources presented is 20 sessions and there are really detailed teacher facilitators notes on delivery and all the activity sheets, informational skills sheets for students are presented and described in detail. So in essence, the whole toolkit ensures that whoever picks this up knows how to deliver it. They don't need to read rounds and rounds and rounds of um, psychological stuff, I call it, because I think that's important. It is psychological. It is underpinned by positive psychology. But what we wanted to do was make it very practical, straightforward and user friendly. So each session has a 20 slide PowerPoint for the teacher to use to present the content to the students alongside the activity sheets and student handouts, which can be um, presented are presented on the CD-ROM, sorry, alongside the supporting teacher notes. So each of the sessions are designed for approximately a 60, 60 minute lesson on each topic. Session one is designed to be introductory and teaches them about what mental health actually is, the definitions and how we think, feel and be well, how we do that, what this means for us. 
Session two focuses on developing a growth mindset and the importance of maintaining that and recognising that actually being optimistic, coming from a position where your glass is half full, using the mantra, I can't do this yet, is hugely important, as is learning from and acknowledging our mistakes um, and not trying to cover them up and being a perfectionist. Session three focuses on emotional literacy skills and why that's important to be emotionally literate, to be able to regulate yourself in particular. Session four focuses on managing stress and anxiety and presents this notion of each individual student being able to build their own toolbox. Session five looks at healthy relationships and what makes them healthy and what makes them unhealthy. So distinguishing between those which are potentially abusive. Session six focuses on sexual awareness, sexual difference. Um, and I think that's a really, really important and hot topic for them at this current time. Session seven, managing their image, again linked to online images, social media and access to that and the impact of this on us in terms of our body image and self-esteem and potential for developing self-harm and eating disorders. Session eight looks at drugs and health and the ways in which we um, should not engage in certain aspects of drug taking and why, but also, of course, not demonising those that do, understanding why this might potentially be a source of support for some people, even though the risks are very high and the potential in terms of damage to their mental, physical, emotional health is also uh, particularly high too. Session nine focuses on managing um, exam stresses and building study skills, which of course is a key area for many of our teens. This is something that many of them talk about as causing them a great deal of stress. Session 10 looks at developing assertiveness and confidence just in general, but being assertive as opposed to being aggressive and being able to make use of those I statements so that you are not uh, potentially becoming a victim of bullying or engaging in learned helplessness. Session 11 um, focuses on coping with sexual behaviours and difference, and that's particularly important given the potential for some of our children who have um, differences and particular issues around their gender and are finding their way in this area. So very, very um, key hot topic again. Also sexual health, how to keep yourself healthy in that particular area and to understand the risks of engaging in risky sexual behaviours. Session 13 is your resilient snake. So this is about building resilience using key tools from positive psychology. So in really introducing this, this topic and giving them a range of key tools and strategies for well-being, which emanate from positive psychology. Session 14 introduces cognitive behaviour therapy tools and again with a view to building resilience and enabling them to challenge their ineffective thinking. Session 15 highlights the use of mindfulness approaches to reduce stress and encourages them to develop their own mindfulness plans and practice as appropriate. But of course also factoring in here the fact that mindfulness is not appropriate to some. It can be particularly re-triggering for those who experience or have um, PTSD. So we need to be careful about that. Session 16 focuses on developing well-being through creative activities. So this is around creating your flow plan. And again, there is a session in this series on this particular topic. And I do think it's an important one that children and young people need to experience um, moments of flow and creativity on a daily basis in order to maintain well-being. Session 17 focuses on understanding and preventing self-harm. And this is particularly important at this time. Um, and also a, a topic very many people find particularly difficult. Um, so this really does um, address some of the myths around this topic, but also presents to the children, young people, ways in which they can access appropriate support and what not to do and what not to say to their friends, who to go to for help. And that's vital. Session 18 looks at attitudes in the community and the way in which teenagers are somehow and sometimes demonised by the adults in those communities and what they can do about that. Session 19 looks at teens in the media and the way in which they're presented and asks them to critically appraise some of the images and also question some of the language that's used, the narratives around descriptions around teenagers and teenage behaviour. And session 20 focuses on future aspirations and goal setting. So it's a lovely conclusion to the whole programme.
and the layout of the modules is very clear and it's the same every time and I think this is really important so it's consistent the students know what to expect um, and basically they run through this same process each time with a first focus a feature focused activity another feature further activity and there are teacher notes as I said earlier and the PowerPoint very very clear in terms of how you deliver the each of the sessions so just a few examples from the resource. I obviously can't go into all of them, but I think that it's lovely just to give you a flavour here. So this is a, one of the activities which is around my exam story. So getting the students to write their own exam stories and very often then going back and thinking about how that was or was not a good experience when they felt nervous, what they could have done differently. So thinking about how they might rewrite that story next time. And they have a go at doing both this, the exam story from the past, from previous experience and then rewriting it as they would like it to be in the future, knowing now what they know in terms of managing some of the stresses of the exam process. When looking at stress and anxiety, we talk about stress busting ideas, making it clear, of course, that not one size fits all. And we talk about a range of different tools and strategies from mindfulness, from regulation, visualisation, grounding, just simple relaxation, physical activity, healthy diet, um, also things like making up your own worry box and sharing worries and how you do that in the best way in terms of accessing support and of course problem solving frameworks. When we're looking at the media and the way in which it presents images of boys and girls um, there is also a focus clearly on how sexist images impact on us as individuals um, so we look at some of the research, and this is particularly from the Girl Guides Attitude Survey 2016. So and this is about getting them to consider this and to think about it and to question themselves why this is having this kind of impact, these sexist images, what it means, what they think that they should do. Because, of course, if 47 percent of girls aged 11 to 21 feel the way they look holds them back, that's also going to have implications further into the future in terms of their levels of confidence, self-esteem and mental health in general. And of course, highlighting the fact that boys are now also being influenced to project themselves in a certain way, to look a certain way. And that they believe the perfect male body exists is also something that we address in this particular session. So one of the slides propo proposes this key question, why do you have body image issues? And again, the lovely thing about the resource, I think, is that it encourages the young people to engage in debates themselves, to come up with their ideas, to thought storm their ideas and think about this. Do they themselves have body image problems or issues? And why is this the case? What's happening? What's impacting on them? What do they need to do about this? Do they need to question it? Do they need to be protesting? Do they need to be doing anything about it at all? And in this slide, of course, they're simply asked to reflect on these images. What do they think? What do they think is going on here? What do they think about the images? What do they think those individuals are feeling? Why are they presenting in this way? Do they think there is a potential for bullying? Do they think there is a potential for self-harm, ill health in the future? What's actually going on? So it's, it's just about generating debate. And of course, what we also focus on is sexting in particular, sending images of themselves, sexually explicit images. And we highlight the legalities around all of this and the fact that there are some enormous issues for our children, and young people today when they do engage in these activities and particularly the consequences in the future. So there are scenarios around individuals who um, basically put images out there and then were very, very traumatised by the way in which they were used by the people that they'd sent them to. So it's about, again, raising awareness and also where do you get help? Where's your first port of call? So we present them with a range of key tools and strategies, but also services who can help them. And again, the session on self-harm also highlights not only where to get help, the do's and don'ts of supporting your friends with this issue, but also um, gives them some opportunity to really debate this issue of self-harm websites and the implications for them in terms of being um, possibly pressured into engaging in self-harm. Um, being triggered by some of the images that they see. And this is important, again, that they debate it, that they discuss it, that we don't just give our judgment, our values on, in, in this particular area.
There is also a focus on the importance of celebrating differences, different ways of life, different relationships, homosexuality in particular, um, being gay, actually adopting a different gender, going through that process. It's very, very important that we really talk about it, that we don't actually allow any of the stigma that sometimes is attached to these particular issues um, to go unchallenged. So students who are presented with a range of different articles and news articles in particular, one of which is sadly about two individual boys, teenagers in Iraq, Iran who were hanged because of their sexuality. And again, this is about generating debate, looking at what goes on out there in the real world and to get them to really begin to think about it, reflect upon it on a deeper level and begin to question perhaps some of their own attitudes, some of the attitudes within their own homes, etc. So a key focus here, of course, is around challenging some of our stereotypical ideas and some of the stereotypes we're presented with, particularly in the media. Celebrating differences, really valuing those differences and asking some of those tricky questions about culture, class, gender, religion and sexuality. And the session on CBT really does um, identify this role of core beliefs. So the ones that we all have um, and how individual they are to all of us, but the fact that they can be positive and negative. We really think about this in terms of how those views impact um, about our thinking around our futures in particular and our views about ourselves. So I'm unlovable, I'm kind, how we view the future, I'll be successful, or the world around me is unfair. So actually just getting them to articulate some of these core beliefs that they may have and thinking about how they impact upon them in terms of their hopes for the future. And this again is one of the activities, thinking about core beliefs and how they might be helpful or unhelpful. And they think about this in particular. Is it helpful to think that everyone in the world is good or bad, for example? So this is really useful and it, it encourages them to work together, to, to think, to reflect a bit more deeply about some of those beliefs that particularly may not be helpful to them. And of course, because core beliefs can lead us to assumptions. And so if, I, if I've got an exam coming up, this might trigger my core belief that I'm stupid. And this assumption will be that I'll never succeed. So the never negative automatic thought would be I won't get good grades. I don't know how to do it. Everyone's going to laugh at me. Therefore, I get into this vicious circle of not trying and therefore I won't achieve, which has confirmed my original belief that I'm not going to get good grades, my, my original assumption. So it's about making those links between thinking, feeling, behaving. And all of these slides are taken directly from the resource. So this is what the children, the young people, the teenagers would actually be viewing in this session. For example, important events such as your exams will trigger or can trigger these core beliefs that lead to NATS, negative automatic thoughts. They're not helpful because they make us feel bad, they affect what we do but they're common patterns of what we call distorted thinking. The final session in the 20 session programme looks at goals for emotional well-being and the students are asked to identify goals within the areas of friendships, education, their career, family, leisure activities, physical and mental health. And again, there are formats and frameworks to support and as part of making those SMART goals, they obviously have to engage in what we call a daily dose of well-being. So we think about some of the tools for their toolbox that will support them in the process of keeping their heads right, retaining and, and, and keeping on with the journey to ensure that they have this kind of sense of equilibrium and overall well-being and peace. So we're asking them also to make up a mindfulness table, to use some of the mindfulness tools that we show them and present in the session on a daily basis and to reflect on when that did and did not help them. And to think about also when is best to use some of these key tools um, of mindfulness. And again, I need to emphasize the fact that, of course, mindfulness is not appropriate for all our children, young people, particularly those with really heightened levels of anxiety, um, particularly to do in a group situation. So this is about actually asking them to engage in this in the home context within the privacy of their own rooms. So being a teenager, it's just a phase they will grow out of it. Such a, an interesting 
thought isn't it but I've heard it again and again people say oh they just go through these awful teenage years it's like when they go through the terrible twos it's all about child development that they'll come through it um the problem is children young people teenagers don't grow out of some of these difficulties these anxieties unless they have the right support and if they don't get some level of intervention which helps them to heal and manage themselves on a daily basis and they won't grow out of it all the research from Kessler onwards is showing us that actually for many of our children young people the teenage years are crucial they won't grow out of these difficulties they will be um, exacerbated and lead to further difficulties more significant psychiatric difficulties and disorders in later years if they are not addressed at this time so it's not just something they're going to grow out of we need to give them the help that they need at this time and also of course don't underestimate they won't grow out of it without the right relationships those nurturing relationships good supportive and conditionally regarding relationships nurturing relationships give us good mental health so we know there's a role here for the significant adult who can listen authentically and support the child and young person to develop the skills that they need and if you want an example of this go and look at ian wright's um, youtube from the channel 4 um, program when he talks about mr pigden the teacher that basically changed his life and ensured that he was the success he is today he, he t t chases this guy straight back it's absolutely wonderful because, of course, we know you can only build resilience as a psychological strength, which is what it is, in the context of a nurturing relationship over time. It doesn't happen by magic. It's not just about personality or something that is born, something within us when we're born. It's a psychological strength and it has to be nurtured in the context of this kind of supportive, empathic relationship over time. So it's not just a phase. They will not just grow out of it. Not without the right support, the right therapeutic relationships and interventions, and certainly not without developing their own toolbox of well-being. But please don't forget in doing this that at this current time in particular, we know it's never been more important for us as adults to be able to regulate ourselves, to regulate our nervous systems, to know and understand how to protect our mental health, if we're going to be able to effectively support our teenagers and our children. Every child matters, we know this, but so does every adult. And our resilience and well-being, it's not just down to us as individuals developing our self-care plans. There are shared responsibilities here in terms of our organisations that we find ourselves working in, the culture and conditions, and also the, the levels of supervision and support that we get. And we need to really prioritise this at this time if we're going to effectively be effective in terms of supporting our teenagers and young people. I'm just highlighting finally a useful resource from Nurture UK again in the series of wellbeing toolkits that we've published with them. The wellbeing toolkit for professionals. Again, this is focusing solely on the mental health and wellbeing of teachers, TAs, LSAs, ELSAs, those working in schools supporting the mental health of our young people. So do have a look at that on their website. So takeaway message today. There are a few wee messages here. What I think at this current time is so important is that we really do listen and understand. We listen to what kids are asking us, what these teenagers are saying they need help and support with. We certainly did that when we were developing this resource. But of course, everything is embryonic. Everything has to change. We need flexibility. There will be other issues arising all the time that children, young people, teenagers want us to work with them on. So we need to listen. We need not to demonise them. We need to challenge those who do, particularly around this whole COVID pandemic, when they're being seen as the people who are giving this to now their grandparents, their parents, because they're being irresponsible. There are so many kids, young people, teenagers who are not being irresponsible. We need to get their views. We need to ensure that their voices are heard and include them in planning their well-being curriculum, not making it a tokenistic gesture. We also need as adults, as professionals, as parents, carers to keep shouting about this need for resources and to ensure that we are there at a preventative level and make sure the systems promote that. We need to develop our systems of support and nominate and train key therapeutic practitioners um, by our mental health leads to make sure that children, young people have access to therapeutic 
authentic listening adults in their context in which they are attempting to learn. We also need to build upon their positive experiences and successes, creating effective peer support systems at this time of COVID. Very, very important that we do that. Really looking at why some of our kids did not get anxious during lockdown, what it was about school prior to that that made them anxious. We need to change a few of the systems and protocols, perhaps. Ultimately, we need to build safety, nurture and hope, showing them that we really trust them and giving them the hope that they need to carry on to really fulfill their potential and maintain their mental health and well-being. So again, thank you very much for listening. And I hope again that this has been useful and, and given you some ideas of some of the practical tools and resources available in this well-being toolkit for teens in particular, but perhaps just also simply raised awareness of you know some of the things that young people have been saying. Uh, particularly during um, lockdown, post-lockdown, what really helped them and why some of them weren't as anxious. Thinking about some of the things that we might be able to change. Uh, we're thinking about creating a new normal for some of our teenagers here. Um, and this is something perhaps we need to give a bit more time to in terms of now reflecting on what we could do differently. So thank you. And I hope you join me for the next session in this series.